starts a legacy. Somebody has to start that, right? Obviously, there's some very famous vineyard families here that have been around, you know, for quite a while that we all know of. And I keep using the name Mondavi because that's undoubtedly the family that really set tone here. But, you know, how do you become one of them? Somebody's got to step up and start it despite adversity. And, you know, that's, I think, the struggle, the challenge, overcoming is really the message you try to share or pass on to your children. I'm very proud of what we've done, and that's exactly what my wife and I really hoped for. So I'm Steve Reynolds with Reynolds Family Winery. I'm the owner and winemaker, I guess, and tequilier, um, if you will, here at Reynolds Family in Napa Valley. So we're right on the Silverado Trail, just almost directly between downtown Yonville and downtown Napa. So what I would consider to be probably one of the prime locations in Napa Valley. I think persistence is sort of a catch-all for probably a lot of people in this valley. Do you want the tragedies along the way or do you want it to sound like it's fun and easy because there, there are a lot of tragedies along the way. You know when we moved here um, this was horse country, chicken ranch country so pretty much the farmers lived down here and the people that just wanted to raise cattle and have kind of a peaceful life. Um, we came here, um, it's really all we could afford. So uh, this is where we landed because simply that's almost all we could afford, literally. So we bought this piece of property and uh, you know, as time turns, like anywhere, right, sometimes those outer seedy sections of a city become the hippest sections 20 years later. And that's kind of what happened here. Um, people started moving down the valley from the heat closer to the bay where the breezes are a little cooler and call that climate change, whatever you want to look at that like. Um, this little piece of Napa Valley has become very popular. So what used to be cattle and chicken country has now become like the uber chic Cabernet area. So we just got very lucky. So we're 10 minutes from downtown. So if you're staying at the Archer Hotel or the Andaz or any of the great hotels downtown, you know, you're not worried about a 45 minute getting from one winery to try to get back to change your clothes for dinner. We're right here, great setting and, you know, couldn't be luckier. Coming to look at this property was quite interesting because, you know, my former career, I don't admit openly very often, I was a dentist. So I was actually seeing patients and I'd moved up here when I was, we just gotten engaged, Susan and I just gotten engaged, moving over from the Central Valley, which is the Stockton Lodi area. And we knew this was an area that we wanted to raise kids and just a little different than the Central Valley. Um, we had friends here, close friends, it was our dating area. So I had moved up here a little ahead of Susie, looking for a place that we would call home. We both kind of agreed we wanted to maybe be gentlemen farmers, but we didn't necessarily know we were going to become winery folk at that time. Knew we wanted to make maybe three or four barrels of wine, like everybody, stay a dentist, sell maybe some grapes, offset the mortgage, and life would be great. Then this property came along, so I, I literally, my realtor called me and said, hey, you know, the very few ranches that were for sale at all, very tough time. And he called me and um, said, hey, can you meet me right after work? This will sell tonight. This will sell within 24 hours. So he goes, just meet me. I go, well, I'm, you know, in a tie. And I'm, he goes, don't worry, it was raining. So I show up, his umbrellas, brings me like rubber boots. We get out and there's literally a dilapidated house, kind of a boarded up house, a collapsed barn, goats, chickens, pigs, horses. And we're trudging around the fields of acres here and there was nothing. And kind of, you know, he said, you know, it's half a million dollars and it'll be gone tomorrow. And you're just like, okay. So I called up Susie, my fiance, and said, hey, I put an offer on a piece of property. I know you haven't seen it yet. You just got to trust me on this. So that's kind of really where this whole thing started was just sort of a complete leap of faith, if, if you'll call it that. Um, you know, we were told at the time that to get into the wine industry, you needed to have at least 10 acres in mind or really just the economy of scale of farming, possibly having a farming company, producing anything large enough that would actually produce some kind of income. It needed to be at least 10 farmable acres and this being 14 acres with a pond, it was pretty perfect for us. I didn't really learn what it took to get into the wine business, but I was intrigued by it. And so much so with my science background and having grown up 
fortunately with a father that was a huge wine collector, spent a lot of time in Europe, living there almost seven years. I started prying into that a little bit, picking at the edges of it, started going to Davis to take classes. Next thing you knew, I'm volunteering working at wineries and learning under other winemakers, giving up more and more days at my dental office, slowly getting an associate so I could spend more time at this. Then I realized to actually build this, I was gonna have to sell my dental practice. And there was one very pivotal moment for us is when actually my father passed away from cancer sort of unexpectedly, um, very young, 61, 62 years old, that, you know, pretty much almost my age now. And it just was this awakening for me that, you know, I'm not going to sit here saying I shoulda, woulda, be a dentist, kinda, wish I would've done the winery, but I never really did it. So it was really that night that my dad passed away that I called my young associate that I'd hired and said, you wanna buy a practice? Yeah, so what we had started in um, my dad, fortunately, before he passed away, got to see the first wines. In fact, he helped me, not made here. Um, in fact, the steel that we're looking at around in this building right now, that truck, those semis pulled in and delivered the steel the day I went to the hospital just in time for him to pass away. I think finding a style in the wine industry is probably one of the hardest things because through failure, through adversity, I was forced to go to these other places where I picked up other things which really you know drove me into this then when we did get this built we really didn't have the money so there were a lot of young winemakers people looking to make a small amount of wine 200 300 cases and they might have been the head winemaker you know at Stag's Leap Wine Cellars but they wanted their own little side gig and they'd come here and make their wine so this kind of became a little pub if you will you know there were like five or six young winemakers here the first couple years I was doing things and let me tell you what I was screwing shit up left and right but but I learned a lot of trickery I learned a lot of you know manipulating mother nature or trying to nurture mother nature or try to help her get along the right path um, but failure would be the most common thing I would say has helped me along the path of figuring out who we are and what we want to be yeah I think back then you know you know this is 25 years ago so there were no optical sorting tables there were no you know a lot of things that we have now access to quick lab results um, the degree of understanding and, and understanding just simple things like feeding yeast the way we do and understanding the health of yeast and things like you know that we're learning through microoxygenation so stylistically we started to learn the basics of the machine. So we were sort of building the car and then what's come along now is I would say the fancy parts of it, the little parts now that made it more comfortable, you know, where now we've got air conditioning, all that great stuff in a car. You know, Micro Ox is a hot thing, right? Um, Acura being great company leading the charge on that with Interstate, you know, but back in those days it was a pretty basic 70s car where you had an 8-track and it still sounded great. It's not that we're saying it wasn't a great time, but you know, we learned things. We learned things about the vineyards. We learned about moisture, stressing vines, leafing, canopy management, just so many different things. I mean, even the spacing of our vineyards, the orientation of our vineyards, of which way to grow. I mean, those are things, you know, before it was like you planted a certain distance because that's the size tractor you had. That's what it was, you know? You know, sometimes I think I almost being this old gray haired guy now, you think about it, I'm one of the more experienced winemakers, and I was laughing because I heard this from Anthony Bell one time, and he said, you know, think about this. I've only done this 40 times, but yet I'm one of the most knowledgeable in the world. You think 40 times, right? You wouldn't want your heart surgeon telling you, dude, I'm the best in the world. I've done this 40 times. I'm pretty good at it, right? So um, it is interesting. Times have changed. But I will tell you, learning to pick riper fruit that was probably the most pivotal thing for me, was not knee jerking and picking too early. So I would say trying to learn to pick for ripeness was probably the key pivotal move for me, was picking better phenolically developed grapes. 
So what are these things that I can do on an off year that's gonna keep me consistent? And I have to worry about that more than others. I've had this conversation with other winemakers from big corporations. They're like, well, I have 80 tanks out there and I just pull from this to make this, this, and this. And they're like, how do you do it? You, 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 you grow your own, you only have this much. You've gotta make everything from your own stuff, which is true. So for us, everything does matter. We don't pick once. The little section of a vineyard, we might pick four times. So we don't just pick, go into a block because again, we have to, you know, economies of scale, we have to bring it in because there's a thousand acres and it might rain, let's pick. Well, I wait the rainstorm out a day or two. Dries up, I get three more weeks of ripeness. My strawberries are all red and delicious. I pick the sunny side because that ripens first, leave the other side. So I think, again, being small sometimes can be an advantage. Um, but as far as, you know, being ahead of the game scientifically, is that an advantage or not? Um, I think you just have to learn to walk the walk and figure out when you're going to walk with Mother Nature and when you're just going to, you know, have to play on the other side. And I think that's the balance of winemaking, is knowing when and when not to mess with something that's already beautiful. The wine business eventually finds you. You might think you're a purist, or you might think you're that technology geek, but in the end, what you're known for out in the world kind of finds you and traps you in the wine world, and that's usually where you should live. <laughs>